Hello, and welcome everyone. My name is Matthew Garza, and I am the Stigma Program Manager here at the Diatribe Foundation. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our program, Lightning Talks, Diabetes Stigma and the Need for Disruption. At Diatribe, we believe that addressing diabetes stigma is an essential missing element of effective diabetes care. Stigma is incredibly pervasive, showing up in the healthcare setting, in conversations with friends, family, and even strangers, in poorly written jokes in the media, you name it. And time and time again, we have seen that this type of stigma is contributing to worse mental and physical health for people with diabetes. To tackle diabetes stigma and its far-reaching negative effects, it's going to take courageous people and creative solutions that dare to challenge the status quo. Because right now, that status quo is bogged down by harmful cultural narratives, misconceptions about diabetes, and not nearly enough collaboration among people with diabetes, researchers, members of industry, healthcare providers, loved ones, and activists. We need to come together and inspire creative, radical, and out-of-the-box solutions in each other. We can, without a doubt, improve the lives of people with diabetes and their loved ones, but we have to be brave enough to go outside of our comfort zone in order to create beautiful change. Every single person here has impact, influence, and power, whether you know it or not. And it's time to harness that power to improve the lives of people with diabetes and reduce the stigma associated with this condition. Now, before we get started, I want to express a huge amount of gratitude to our sponsors who have made this event and all of Diatribe's work possible. Thank you to both of our program sponsors, Dexcom, which does so much to improve the lives of people with diabetes through technological innovation and Eli Lilly and company whose advancements in therapies help people manage their diabetes every single day. Before we really dive in, let me give you a quick rundown of the event. We have four amazing speakers lined up for you today and each one is going to deliver their take on our topic, diabetes stigma and the need for disruption. We want to encourage you all to share your thoughts and your experiences with us in the stage chat throughout the event. There will also be poll questions going up in the tab labeled polls. Thank you in advance for answering these questions because they really help us not only understand your experience, but also help us create better events for you. After our lightning talks are complete, I do hope that you'll stay online for community networking with us. It's so nice to be able to chat together as a diabetes community. You can do this by clicking on the people icon on the left side of your screen after the talks. It is now my honor to be able to introduce our first Lightning Talk speaker, though I have a feeling that she hardly needs an introduction. Renza Shabilia has had type 1 diabetes since 1998 and is a fierce advocate and activist for the diabetes community. She is currently the head of communities and international affairs at Diabetes Australia, and in her role there and throughout her career, she has been continuously outspoken on the issue of diabetes stigma. I am so excited for her to kick off our event today. Renza, thank you so much for helping us set the stage. And so without further ado, please take it away. Thank you so much, Matthew. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands where I am coming to you from. I'm on the lands of Wurundjeri people and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal people watching today. So yes, my name is Renza Shabilia and I've lived with diabetes for almost 25 years, more than half my life. And for over 21 of them, I've been working for diabetes organisations. And during that time as an advocate and an activist, I've been a fierce defender of the right for people with diabetes to have a seat at the table to shape or to reshape, which is I think is what we need to do now, the way diabetes is seen in the world. Because, you see, diabetes has an image problem and with that image problem comes stigma. So for now, a very short video. Could you do that in the bathroom or something? It looks amazing. It looks like diabetes on a plate. Should you be eating that? You really should have taken better care of yourself.
This video was part of Diabetes Australia's campaign from 2021 on diabetes stigma. Now, I can't see the people who are watching today. I can't see your reactions, but I have a feeling that I know how you would be responding, especially those of you living with diabetes. It's likely that you would have recognised some of what you saw. Uh, you may remember how you felt when some of those things happened. You might remember a particularly hurtful comment that made you withdraw perhaps and stop speaking with others about your diabetes. You might recall a time when you made the decision to stop doing diabetes tasks in front of others, to hide it away. You might recall a time when you made the decision to stop being to, to stop um, doing and talking about diabetes because you didn't want the negative attention um, that, that, that often comes if somebody sees you checking your glucose levels or giving yourself an insulin injection. You may be thinking about the number of years that it had been when you stopped actually seeing diabetes health professionals because you didn't want to face being told off again. And I know this because I've experienced that just like 80% of people living with diabetes. And I know this because Diabetes Australia worked closely with the diabetes community to learn about experiences of stigma associated with diabetes. Uh, and the examples that you saw were the stories that, that were shared with us by people with diabetes. In our community outreach, we heard stories, heartbreaking stories, dozens and dozens of stories. And the themes we heard were gathered together and represented in the video that you just saw and a partner video they were the stories of John and Cassie, but really they were the stories of countless people with diabetes who had had the same experiences. Diabetes Australia's campaign hit the nail on the head. And yes, that is because we have an absolutely amazing and world-class campaigns team. And I can say that because all the kudos and credit goes to them. And I'm not actually really part of that team. So I'm not crediting myself. It's all them. But there's another reason, and that is because we worked so closely with the diabetes community to make sure that we accurately told the stories that had been so generously, so vulnerably and so openly shared with us. By engaging meaningfully at every step along the way, we had an authentic and a genuine campaign that laid bare the words and phrases and experiences that people with diabetes had told us about. And the community, not only in Australia, but across the world told us that for the first time ever that they saw the reality of their diabetes and their experiences played back to them. There was no intent to name, shame or blame uh, the people uh, at whose feet, I guess, the, the, you know, who are the source of that stigma. No one wins if we start to weaponize people's negative experiences. But I know that we did have some, some hesitation at how that last vignette in that video would be received. You know, the one where the health professional is seen to be standing over John and telling him that it was all his fault um, with how, how, you know, what was going on with his health. Our nervousness was that at how prof health professionals might respond. Would they feel defensive? Would we feel that, they, that we were shaming them? But we knew that to remain true to the stories and experiences of stigma, we had to show this because sadly for many people with diabetes, the place they felt most stigmatised about their condition was while in front of healthcare with their healthcare team. It would be confronting and it would be challenging. But there is one thing that Diabetes Australia knows how to do in our campaigns and that is to be bold and that is exactly this thinking, the thinking that we need if we are to challenge stigma and to make real change. Stigma doesn't exist in a vacuum. It sits alongside discussions of diabetes-related complications and of new diabetes diagnosis. It can be found every time that we talk about the financial burden of diabetes and the cost to health systems. It can be found in the homes and the workplaces and at the family dinner tables. It can be found at in the, in the campaigns of some health or diabetes organisations that we hope would know better. And as we know, it can happen in healthcare settings. It happens in places that people with diabetes should feel safe and where they should feel comfort. And perhaps most cruelly, it happens within ourselves. Internalised stigma can be paralysing when it results in denying ourselves care, causes us to socially isolate and makes us believe that we are not enough. Stigma is tightly intertwined with every single aspect of diabetes because for too long the status quo of diabetes and its image problem has been accepted. And so to challenge this status quo, we need to reconsider diabetes in a big way, 
It means not being quiet when we hear diabetes and people with diabetes being stigmatised. It means standing up and being an ally. It means being unapologetic in our refusal to accept any time people with diabetes are blamed, judged, shamed or made to feel stigmatised. Addressing stigma is more than addressing the unoriginal and tired so-called jokes that we hear. It's also about being bold and going big. It's um, it's about not um, accepting the baseline story of diabetes occurs in some communities which people in those communities often face. Reframing diabetes starts with how we define it. We need to stop explaining the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes with phrases like this. People with type 1 diabetes couldn't have prevented the condition. Well, that may be true. It's the words that we're not saying that stigmatise. Can you hear them? Can you hear the heavy insinuation? People with type 2, yeah, they could have. We need to stop using words like lifestyle disease when talking about type 2 diabetes because not only does that minimise the seriousness and complexity of the condition, but it also suggests that the personal responsibility and therefore the personal failure is the reason for the diagnosis, and that is just not true. At Diabetes Australia, our efforts to reframe diabetes and redefine the way we speak about different types of diabetes mean that we resort to facts. As a spokesperson for the organisation, I am frequently asked to explain the different types of diabetes. And you'll hear me say something like this. Uh, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition where the body no longer produces insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the body is unable to use insulin properly or doesn't produce enough insulin. When we use facts, we remove bias. When we remove bias, we stop stigma. Discussion, discussion, discussions of stigma are not new, and they didn't start when diabetes organisations started running, about, running campaigns. In fact, Diabetes Australia's work focusing on stigma, much like our pioneering work in the Language Matters movement, proudly stands on the shoulders of diabetes community discussions. We were able to be bold and look at things differently because the community showed us how to do that. Now, is it any? surprise the game-changing approaches came from the diabetes community. This is the very community that created networks and support groups to learn from each other and build each other up. This is the very community that started the Spare a Rose campaign that has over the last 10 years raised more than $700,000 to support people with, di in, with diabetes in need. This is the very community that's, that not only said we are not waiting, but then went about creating a way to accelerate technology advancements and put them in the hands of people with diabetes. This is a community where hashtags like talk about complications became a movement and where movements become a roar, and that is what we need. But we have to recognise that the stigma that so many people in the community rail against is also present within its confines. In fact, it is often in response to stigma from outside the diabetes world that we see some pretty scrappy arguments within it. There's a huge dose of stigma when people with diabetes go to great pains to make sure that the tacky comment about diabetes on a plate wasn't aimed at them. That was at those people with type 2 diabetes. These types, type wars, are sadly, they sadly add a different degree of stigma and one that can often seem more harmful and more hurtful because it's coming from our own people. We are undoubtedly stronger when we are united in a charge against diabetes stigma, but we already know that. What we need is a revolution in the way that we highlight stigma as part of every aspect of diabetes rather than a separate issue that we can box up neatly. We started to do that at Diabetes Australia. That video I showed at the beginning of the talk was part of a three-year campaign on diabetes and mental health. Stigma ran through the whole campaign when we spoke about the burden of diabetes, diabetes burnout, and the way others see diabetes. But perhaps, and a little unexpectedly, we also talk about stigma in work around hypoglycemia, diabetes-related complications, complications screening, access to and the use of diabetes technologies. Uh, and interactions with loved ones and health professionals. Our revised Language Matters position statement came um, with discussions about not only words, but also images and attitudes and how they contribute to stigma. Earlier this year, when we were asked to provide media comment on a government agency report about the growing numbers of people with diabetes and what needs to be done, we brought in the issue of mental health support and why it's necessary, highlighting how stigma adds to the mental burden of living with diabetes. Because that's the thing about diabetes stigma, 
It is part and parcel of all aspects of diabetes and it is also in, it, 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 and, and the harmful consequences. But we can't accept the status quo and we can't accept that it can't be changed. Um, we can't accept that the burden of diabetes stigma is something that people with diabetes just simply have to live with, that it's part of it. We have to keep raising awareness about it. And we have a huge debt of gratitude to people with diabetes who are willing to share their stories of stigma because when enough people understand just how impactful stigma is, how harmful it is, the consequences of it and how far-reaching they are, that is when we see change. We are sitting here today this morning, tonight, whatever time it is around in your part of the world, talking about stigma and elevating it as an important part of diabetes and an important part of diabetes management. And we need to make sure that we keep doing that. It has to keep happening. It has to be at the forefront of everybody's attention. We need stigma to be on comp diabetes conference um, programs, which it is starting to be more and more. And we need to be challenged, challenging it constantly. We can and do that. We just need to be brave. We need to be bold. We not. We just simply cannot accept that this is part of what diabetes is. And mostly, we need to listen to the stories of people with with diabetes, diverse people with diabetes, to better understand what it is that they need, so that they stop feeling stigmatized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renza, for sharing all of that incredible information and for reminding us and encouraging us to be bold with our ideas and our campaigns. And I especially thank you for highlighting all of the pioneering work that Diabetes Australia has done. I know that I have learned so much about advocacy from the work that you all do there. And your talk really just reminded me of a quote that you use quite often, actually, of nothing about us without us. And I think that that really just highlights how important it is that we center people with diabetes in all of the advocacy efforts that we're doing. Thank you so much, Renza. Next, I am pleased to welcome Brian Fitzgerald. Brian is a founder and co-director of Dancing Fox, a creative agency specializing in mischief, magic, and mind bombs for artists and activists, where they help to craft transformational stories for a more beautiful world. A lifelong activist, Brian spent 35 years with Greenpeace, where he pioneered digital campaigning and collaborated in campaign and communication strategies that shifted the environmental practices of governments, corporations, and entire sectors. I'm thrilled to be able to learn more about the power of magic and disruption and how we can apply these ideas and skills and methods to fight diabetes stigma. Brian, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Rensa, for that call to courage and boldness and to roar. That just resonates with me so much. I'm here because I'm a troublemaker. I've made social change my life study and practice and passion. And I am here to talk to you today about the power of story, the power of mischief, and the power of hope-based invitational activism. But most of all, I'm here to talk to you about beautiful disruption and how it can change behavior. So, whoop. sorry, having a little bit of a tech breakdown here and we're back. Okay, so what's Beautiful Disruption got to do with ending stigma and the behavior of stigmatizing diabetes and people with diabetes? Well. Think about what stigma is. It's a social behavior. And what governs whether we collectively permit or prohibit a social behavior? The stories that we collectively tell each other about what's right and what's normal. Stories are these coded messages we send to ourselves about what it means to be a good human. And the only way that behavior changes is when those stories change. And those stories only change when we collectively change our mind about what's weird and what's normal. So this is social change in a nutshell. It happens when a critical mass takes a fringe belief or a behavior and turns it into a norm, brings it from the edge and brings it into the mainstream. The idea that a woman could vote was once a weird idea that became normal. And the suffragist movement did amazing creative work to change what people believed was common sense. And that went from a story that 
everyone knows that women are inferior to everyone knows that women have exactly the same rights as men. And in my lifetime, I've seen foundational stories shift um, from smoking is glamorous to smoking is gross and it will kill you and the people around you. From the idea of marriage being something that is strictly between man and woman to love is love. Or the idea that sexual harassment can be excused through the story of boys will be boys, uh, shifting to the idea of me too and she said. So the question is, how can we make stigmatizing diabetes as backwards as denying women the vote? We can do something called norm engineering. By changing the underlying stories that give people social permission to stigmatize diabetes and by changing the majority perception of the majority belief. So what is this norm engineering? It's a way of changing behavior through signals and stories, not by changing beliefs, but by changing what people believe to be the norm. And this is because we swim in this sea of invisible cities, of invisible stories that shape our behavior every day. And it's mostly without our even knowing it. Some stories just become so commonly um, believed and adapted that we forget that they're stories. Days of the week is a perfect example. Monkeys don't get happy on Friday. Giraffes don't get the Monday blues. Um, this is just a story that we tell ourselves. But think about how different what seems possible or normal is on a Sunday versus a Wednesday. These things profoundly shape our behavior and they're going on in the background all the time. But if we're conscious of them and we're conscious of how they're shaping behavior, we can use them in some very powerful ways. It works because we are at base herd creatures. We pressure one another to conform in unseen ways every minute of every day. In our play shops, we show a, um, a candid camera clip of um, these subjects that walk into an elevator and everybody else walks into the elevator and faces the rear. And the suffering on these people's faces, they try to you know, decide if they're gonna conform to this behavior or not. And eventually they all turn around and face the back of the elevator just because everyone else is. And this is because cooperation and tribal identity are hard to build. Evolution has made them super resilient because people who were able to work together and to work through their differences were more successful than people who couldn't. Evolution has spent millions of years selecting us for our ability to cooperate. And that means we have a built-in reluctance to embrace opinions that are different from our tribe mates, especially in matters where our identity is concerned. It's easier to change our opinion than it is to change our view of who we are. We like to think that our brains are like scientists, you know, gathering information and observing and forming our opinions on the basis of what we see, but they're actually more like hack politicians. We're watching those polls and trying to see what position is gonna be the most popular. So with all this inbuilt resistance to minority views and changing our minds, how does social consensus ever change? How does the weird ever become normal? Well, let's ask a scientist. Let's not just ask any scientist, let's ask Betsy Levy Palak. Um, she's from Princeton. She was given a genius grant by the MacArthur Foundation to study norms and social change. And she did a brilliant field experiment with two villages in Rwanda. Um, and her observation was that hate radio was stirring up ethnic violence in these villages between Hutus, Tutsis, and Twas. And so her thesis was, shouldn't we be able to create the opposite? What if reconciliation radio could heal? So she designed a clinical study with placebos, controls, and one variable, a prime time radio soap opera. And the soap opera was carefully constructed with this Romeo Juliet story about love across tribal lines at the center. Every hero was a peacemaker. Violence was treated as fringe and cast in the most negative light. The entire community was pictured as unified against violence and against discrimination. And the result, not one person changed their mind. Hutus who said they would never trust a Tutsi still had exactly the same opinion and level of distrust. Twas, who said they would never let their daughter marry a Hutu, still held that opinion. But what did change was their perception of what the majority opinion was in the village. 
they considered their opinion now to be a minority view. And that changed behavior. That reduced the rate of violence. It reduced the self-reported likelihood of acting out on prejudice. It's worth looking at the entire body of studies backing up this idea and Betsy Levy Pollack's entire um, body of work. Um, it's incredibly powerful in making the case that you don't need to change someone's mind to change their behavior. You just need to change their perception of the majority view. The C uh, CDC did a study on what caused people's individual decisions to stop smoking throughout the 80s and the 90s. And it wasn't the health information, which most people ignored. Um, legislators and healthcare professionals took the health information very seriously and they created, you know, smoke free zones, um, designated smoking zones in office buildings, outright banning indoor smoking in some cases when, you know, the evidence of the danger of secondhand smoke started to arise. But people's individual decisions to stop smoking had to do with two factors. One was the cost of cigarettes as taxes drove the prices up. But the other one was the feeling of ostracism, the feeling that they were not any longer in the norm. Whereas they used to be able to sit at their desk and smoke a cigarette, they now had to get up, walk across the room, go to a designated area or go outside. This was no longer normal behavior. This was weird behavior. And this more than anything is what contributed to the individual decisions to stop smoking. So what is it that shapes these norms that we can get our hands on? How can we actually actively work against stigma? Well, we can start with stories and visible signals, um, like the stories that Rensa shared with us about um, people being you know, publicly shamed and, and making that a negative. Um, stories get stronger every time they're retold. And if you want a story to be accepted as explaining the world, you need to tell it visibly and repeatedly again and again. And for the suffragettes, um, this meant defying the norms of what it, uh, what it meant to be, you know, to appear in public as a woman. Um, if you weren't allowed to wear trousers, if you were only allowed to wear petticoats, okay, well, you can't wear a petticoat when you're riding a bicycle. So we'll design something called the bicycle suit, the bloomer. And it's okay if you're riding on a bicycle, right? And then we'll have picnics where a lot of women get together. So there's solidarity in wearing this unusual and weird piece of clothing. And then we'll walk our bicycles to the bicycle picnics. And then we'll just walk to the bicycle picnics and you know, little by little chipping away at that norm that said women cannot wear trousers in public. Um, there are institutional signals that government, the AMA, Physicians for Social Responsibility, all can be sending. Um, there was a great example of a legislative hack that was done in the EU when uh, campaigners that were working against single-use plastic um, got in touch with a catering company that catered the European Parliament. This was a year in front of an important vote on single-use plastic, and they got them to swap out all of the single use plastic in the parliament with reusables and refillables. And this sent a norming signal about that change to everyone who was in that room who was about to make a decision. And a year later, they made the proper vote and adopted sweeping change against single use plastic. Um, influencer signals, the signals that celebrities send can be tremendously powerful. They're culture makers and culture shapers. And you know the signal that they once sent about smoking used to be this, it's glamorous, it's seductive. And then in the 1980s, um, Brooke Shields, who was a tremendous icon of cool, started putting up these ads that made smoking look profoundly unglamorous and weird. There are cultural and media signals that we can be sending. You know, popular culture is this restless beast. It doesn't always just reflect what's popular. It can also shift the perception of what's popular. And, you know, shows like Will and Grace and Modern Family have massively shifted people's perception of what the American family is. And finally, you're on the winning side signals to people with diabetes, to people working against stigma. This is so important. It's absolutely crucial. And this means that you know, every time a healthcare professional changes their language or behavior as a re result of reading Diatribe's destigmatized website, it's a win and it ought to be told. 
every time public perception of diabetes as a self-inflected disease drops a percentage point, it's a win and it needs to be shouted from the rooftops. Every time another celebrity comes out as having diabetes and refuses to bow to shame, it's a win and it needs to be celebrated. And in my experience, Activists and advocates can be really shy about this for fear of looking like you're winning will mean a lowering of the urgency or a lowering of expectation that people need to support you. But it's the opposite because it's only when people in large numbers come to believe that change is possible, that change becomes possible. And those signals that you are winning are signals that change is possible. So the question I leave you with is this. How many ways can we signal that stigmatizing people with diabetes is weird and wrong? In other words, how many ways can we tell the stories that we need to tell to change the perception of the norm or to be disruptively clear? What are the stories we need to tell to change the world? Thank you very much. Brian, every time that I hear you talk and every time that I have the pleasure of working with you, I always come away so inspired by what is possible when all of us come together and utilize these tools like norm engineering. And I can only hope that we are as successful in our movement as some of these other movements have been. And I know that at Diatribe, we're doing everything we can to make this a reality and sprinkling in just a little bit of magic to do just that and to make sure that we are on the winning team, because I believe that we are. Thank you so much. Now we are ready to move on to our next speaker, Tony Pearson. Tony was recently named the Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion in Clinical Trials at Eli Lilly and Company, where he is responsible for the design, implementation, and oversight of strategies to ensure appropriate representation of diverse participants and investigators for trials across all therapeutic areas. In the little bit of time that I have had the pleasure of knowing Tony, I have seen how much of a passion he has for access and for health equity, and I'm thrilled to invite him to our stage today. Thank you so much, Tony, for being here with us. Hey, Matthew, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for having me and providing me with the opportunity uh, to lend my voice and thoughts on this important topic. Uh, today, I'd like to take just a few moments uh, to cover three areas, kind of review current state, talk about stigma, and then offer just a few solutions for the intention of approaching and overcoming bias and stigma in this space. So as it relates to current state, uh, care for people living with type 2 diabetes has reached a new era. Uh, this era is characterized by advanced blood glucose monitor, efficacious medications, and decades of diabetes knowledge. The components of this new era of care should be driving a gold standard of healthcare outcomes for all. However, the literature suggests that only about 50% of people living with diabetes achieve their HbA1c goals, and only about 20% achieve combined HbA1c blood pressure and cholesterol care standards. Let's pull that data thread through for just a moment. According to the CDC, more than 34 million Americans uh, live with diabetes and approximately 95% of that number are living with type two diabetes. Further, approximately 88% or 88 million Americans have prediabetes. Uh, if we look at cost, which was mentioned earlier, an approximate uh, cost uh, for all diabetes care and diabetes impact on production, uh, productivity, at least in 2017 was estimated to be uh, 327 billion. Recognizing the interrelation of diabetes and obesity, let's talk about that data as well. Obesity, having been recognized as a disease by the American Medical Association in 2013, affects approximately 42 million American adults. Prevalence by race, according to the 2020 National Health in in Interview Survey by the CDC and U.S. Census Bureau, indicates that 14.7% of American Indians and Alaska Natives live with type 2 diabetes, 12.5% of Hispanics, 11.7% African Americans and Blacks, 9.2% uh, of Asians, all have greater prevalence of diabetes than their white counterparts of 7.5%. Uh, as the numbers I gave earlier indicate, it's important to focus on health equity, absolutely, but this is an, uh, an opportunity and issue for, for us all. According to a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019 that looked at projected U.S. state-level prevalence of adult obesity and severe obesity, it's estimated uh, that by 2030, approximately 50%, rising from that 42% I indicated earlier, uh, of American adults would be living with, uh, or projected to live with obesity, with nearly 25% or one in four of that number expected to live with severe obesity. 
As with diabetes, there is a health equity component within obesity, as according to research published in 2021 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, that looked at predicted BMI trajectories by race and ethnicity, they indicate that both Black and Hispanic women are projected to have higher BMIs over their life course than their white counterparts, which becomes particularly important once they become Medicare eligible, as presently there's a gap for obesity coverage. The cost here, according to a 2020 report by the Milken Institute, estimates that the serious chronic condition of obesity has a direct cost of $307 billion with a greater than one trillion with a T in, ind in indirect costs. For obesity and diabetes to be such serious chronic conditions, so serious in fact that they've been articulated as twin epidemics, given the advances in medication, telehealth, supportive online and app-based tools, and advanced data analytics from machine learning to artificial intelligence, it is unfathomable and dare I say unconscionable that such poor health outcomes are allowed to persist. So why do they persist? Uh, as we and, and obviously we're going to talk here about stigma, uh, and as I get there, I'll just take a point of personal privilege. Because stigma is so personal, it's important to hear in this space from trusted voices. And some of the most trusted voices are these amazing women. I, I have the privilege of working with a colleague in advocacy and professional relations at, at Eli Lilly Company called named Sarah Noel, and she is phenomenal. Uh, external to our organization, there are uh, people like uh, Kelly Close, certainly a convener and educator and voice of veracity in diabetes for years. In the obesity space, women like Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford on obesity and health equity, and have the privilege of being joined today by Renza, and, and who you'll hear from Elise uh, a little bit later. But one person I'd like to, to recognize is Dr. Rebecca Poole. And I don't know Dr. Poole personally, but I do know her research. And so she's of the Rudd Center of Food Policy and, and Health, and I know you all know her well. Uh, she's probably online. Uh, but indicating that disease stigma is when people are blamed for their disease, leading to things like health disparities and lower quality of care. What we also see for both diabetes and obesity is internalized bias and stigma, where people living with diabetes, as mentioned by Renza earlier, uh, and or obesity, adopt negative beliefs about others uh, of others about themselves and can start to believe that they are lazy or unattractive or unintelligent or undisciplined, and that the outcomes that they are experiencing are their fault because of choices they either made or failed to make. This internalization um, in the case of diabetes can result in people not taking their insulin and checking their blood sugars less frequently. And in the case of obesity, as articulated by the Obesity Action Coalition, can result in receiving fewer preventative health services and exams, more frequent cancellation of uh, delay of appointments, and less time spent discussing their obesity with their physician. So as we think through solutions, two that I'd like to raise today exist in research and policy. And without question, there certainly needs to be more research done to understand the fissures in the healthcare system to clearly identify where people who are impacted are being missed. Earlier this year, uh, Eli Lilly sponsored a partial edition of Health Affairs, and those papers examined opportunities to modernize policy and practice for those people living with type 2 diabetes specifically. Why do I bring up these papers? Well, it's because each paper had a central focus on how to best increase diabetes care outcomes, but they did it through the lens of health equity, just happened to sort of land that way. And the value of health equity is that the rising tide of addressing care for underserved communities truly raises the standard of care for all communities impacted by that particular chronic condition. Further, bias and stigma can result in majority group members having an experience that is analogous to their minority mem group member counterparts, a common experience that is not the result of personal fault, but of circumstance. This understanding is key to elevating the voice of the patient and putting the person first, providing them with support in a complex health ecosystem, rather than blaming them for outcomes that, it, that are not their fault, Health equity quite literally requires us to see the person as being more than the outcomes associated with their condition. Investment in health equity research is an example of how we as industry can move the needle forward, supporting peer reviewed literature and resources to inform ways to consider and combat bias and stigma and overcome the associated negative outcomes. Additionally, I think it's important for us to raise awareness and support legislation that will move the needle to evolve the policy and practice that's associated with obesity. As I indicated earlier, the twin epidemics of diabetes and obesity impact millions of Americans and are only projected to impact millions more. The value of supporting entities, be it patient groups or advocacy organizations, is that advocating for policy and legislative changes related to obesity compels a conversation on bias and stigma for policymakers, for providers, for payers, and for the pharmaceutical industry itself. Many times when our voice as industry is at the table, it can appear that we have an enlightened self-interest. We've had our fair share of fingers pointed at us. But rather than pointing a finger at another entity in the healthcare continuum, I think it more impactful for us to open our hands, to endeavor to lock arms with patients, patient organizations, policymakers, payers, and providers, and decide that we will no longer allow bias and stigma to prevent us from supporting legislative changes that will positively impact the lives of millions 
and allow us to realize the full value of this new era of care that exists for type 2 diabetes, while significantly evolving the critical support needed for people living with obesity. And Brian said, change is possible. We need to find those policy opportunities, and we need to take action to make them a reality. Hey, thank you very much, Matthew. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Tony. I'm so incredibly grateful that we were able to have you with us today. And I really appreciate how you helped us remember exactly what the research shows on stigma, that the impact of stigma goes beyond just being offended by a joke, but that it can hurt mental and physical health. And thank you for expressing just how crucial it is that we keep health equity at the center of our efforts on diabetes stigma, especially as we work to bend the curve on the diabetes and obesity epidemics. Thank you so much. Now, last, but certainly not least, I am so incredibly grateful to have our next speaker joining us today. Elise D'Alessandro is a queer plus size influencer based in Cleveland, Ohio, who is thriving with type two diabetes. Her social media, Ready to Stare, and corresponding blog, readytostare.com, focus on creating inclusive fashion, travel, and lifestyle content for everyone. She is an incredible change maker who is showing people what life with diabetes can look like if you aren't hindered by what ifs and limitations. Elise, I'm so excited to have you here with us today, and I cannot wait to listen to your talk along with our audience. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And I feel lucky to go last because we've heard a lot of things in theory, right? A lot of statistics, but I am a living, breathing uh, type, a person living with type two diabetes who faces this stigma every day because I also live in a larger body. So I'm gonna talk to you a lot about my personal experience and I hope that that can kind of illuminate some of these statistics that we've heard today. Uh, as Matthew mentioned, I'm a plus size model and lifestyle influencer and I focus on fashion travel and LGBTQ content on my blog. And across my social media platforms, I have a combined 1 million impressions every month. Uh, and sometimes my life is super glamorous. Right now I am in a hotel in Milan, Italy, because I am here for an LGBT travel convention. And sometimes my life is not so glamorous. I'm on the road. My CGM just got knocked off by a seatbelt in the car. And I'm in rural Wyoming trying to find a replacement CGM. So luckily, I have made authenticity a huge part of my platform because you just never know what's going to happen when you're along on this journey with me. So six and a half years ago, I sat in my doctor's office and I was leaving for a cruise the next day. I had gone in a few days prior for a physical because I wanted to get a prescription for motion sickness patches. Um, if you are in America, you know uh, that the healthcare system uh, is a little wacky. So I figured that doing a whole physical would be a cheaper way uh, to have my insurance cover the appointment. And, and in that part of that whole physical, uh, they tested my A1C. Uh, and when my doctor insisted that I come in for a follow-up, I tried to tell him, I can't come. I got. I just need those motion sickness patches. I'm trying to go on a cruise. And he said, no, you have to come in. And I'm so glad that I listened uh, because he told me that I had type 2 diabetes. And I was only 28 years old. It's funny to me now, but my first question was, can I still go on the cruise? Uh, I think I was in shock. Uh, we talked through my immediate treatment needs and some additional tests I'd need to go through to ensure I could go on the cruise the next day. And I took most of it in stride before truly breaking down. Uh, diabetes does run in my family. And I knew that it was a matter of when. Uh, I, I knew it was a matter of when and not if. I knew that I would eventually get uh, type 2 diabetes because of how strong it is in my family. I just didn't expect it to happen in 28. Uh, but I did end up being able to go on that cruise. And while I was away, I went on a deep sea submarine tour. I went zip lining, cave tubing. I hung on the beach in Honduras with my friends. And the majority of people that I met, they didn't know that I did all of that just one day after finding out I had diabetes. Over my first year of being diagnosed, I made the choice not to discuss having diabetes publicly, even though I had built this large public platform as a plus size model and body positive advocate, because I wanted to use that first year to challenge myself to conquer a lot of my own fear. So I made this conscious decision that I was going to spend this year, that first year, living with diabetes and not living in fear of diabetes. My motto really became, it's okay to be afraid, but do it anyways. Still my motto today. Uh, this year brought, that first year brought some of my biggest personal and professional accomplishment, accomplishments. In addition to zip lining, I went horseback riding for the first time in years. I did a lot of business-related traveling. I was featured on Good Morning America. I did modeling jobs all over the country and long editorial shoots, and I really pushed myself creatively. 
But I remember when I first found out that I had type 2 diabetes, I remember I called a close friend and I told him, um, you know, I have type 2 diabetes. And I'll, I'll never forget what he said. He said, I'm sure you feel like this is a death sentence. Well, who wants to hear that at 28 years old? Uh, and years later, the fact that he, those words left his mouth still make me mad, honestly. Uh, but I have more of an understanding of why he and other people think this way. It's that stigma. We've heard about it all, all events so far, but society trains us to believe that being in a larger body and having diabetes are the worst things that could happen to you. As someone with a platform uh, showing fashion and being a model, I had been hearing that I would die from diabetes for years before I even had it. Because when you exist in a larger body, you are the projection of people's greatest fears, right? And words like obesity, just hearing it over and over again in that last talk is tough because it's been so stigmatized and used against me and weaponized. Uh, so I have been hearing you're going to die from diabetes the whole, like from strangers leaving comments on my pictures. Uh, as someone living in a larger body existing on the internet, we call these people health concern trolls. And they have been leaving comments under my photos telling me that I'm gonna die from diabetes for years. And my diagnosis made me confront this idea that I can't just snap back what my, my go-to response always was, which is you can't tell someone's health by looking at them. That is true. Not all larger body people have diabetes, not all straight sized people as the word that we use in the, in the fashion industry, which means uh, thin people, they all don't have, like they also have diabetes. So you really can't tell what's going on in someone's body by looking at them. And that had always been my go-to response. Uh, and that is still true. That statement is still true. Uh, but those people who were telling me the way you look as a larger body person means you have diabetes. It was now true for me, right? Even though where it was coming from from them was based in fat phobia, it was now true. So although I already loved my body the way that it looked, I had to learn to reframe the way that I looked at my own health. The worst thing that someone could wish upon me or try to use against me to lure me into hating myself, I already had. I already had diabetes. They'd wished it upon me. I had it. And here I am just living that unafraid life. So I've come to realize that the reactions that people have to type 2 diabetes are really often projections of their own fear. And I've also had to learn that that fear belongs to them and not to me, because I know that this diagnosis is not a death sentence. I had not been handed a death sentence because People of all sizes live and thrive every day with diabetes. My own diagnosis gave me a major key to understanding what was going on in my body. My body was going to have diabetes either way, but now that I knew that I had it, I could work to treat it. And that knowledge was powerful. Ultimately, I decided to talk about living with type 2 diabetes a year after my diagnosis because I wanted other people living in larger bodies and living with diabetes to know that they're not alone. I didn't want anyone else to feel that shame or that guilt that we're told to feel when we're diagnosed. We're told to, that it's our faults. We're told that we, we, we did this to ourselves. And that prevents a lot of folks from type 2 diabetes from talking about it, from finding community, and ultimately getting the help that they need to, to treat what's going on in their body. So a few years after my diagnosis, I started wearing the Freestyle Libre Continuous Glucose Monitor, and I started wearing it during the pandemic when we were in lockdown. You know, I built so much of my platform of you can't tell someone's health by looking at them, and not all pe people in larger bodies have diabetes, but I realized that wearing a CGM kind of outs me as a person living with diabetes. As a queer person, we use outs as out of the closet. So same kind of idea. Uh, this was another way that I could educate folks about living with type 2 diabetes. So since that moment, uh, I've made the choice to wear my CGM proudly in my modeling campaigns. I've made, made videos about it. I'm now an ambassador for Freestyle Libre. Um, and I had photographers ask me, if they wanted, if I wanted them to Photoshop my CGM out of the photos, um, and I told them absolutely not. I want it to be visible because living proudly with type two diabetes is part of who I am. Just like being plus size or being queer, I can't take off this part of my identity or Photoshop it out when it's convenient for me. I'm always going to have diabetes. 
And I realized that through this whole journey, six and a half years now, that I am not the manifestation of someone's greatest fear. I'm a whole person worthy of being treated with dignity and respect. I also realize now that I have the opportunity to not only help others with type 2 diabetes feel less alone, but hopefully can serve as a bridge between those living with type 2 diabetes and those living in, with type 1, because we are in this together. I hope that what I shared today helps type 1 folks understand why clarifying that you're not one of those diabetics only reinforces the weight-based stigma of type 2, and it's not helping us. Uh, when you do that, you're further pushing type two folks into this cycle of shame. Just like you didn't choose to have diabetes, we didn't choose it either. Our journeys are not the same. Our, the way that diabetes functions in our bodies is not the same, but together we can challenge this idea that type two diabetes is something that someone gets because of personal choice. This harmful narrative is not only inaccurate, but it prevents all of us from really seeking the treatment that we need individually. And it prevents us from getting the societal support that we need for legal and medical advocacy. Only a few weeks after my diagnosis, I met with a diabetes educator, and I told her about a few things I'd been researching. I asked her some questions, and her approach was really kind and empathetic. And one thing in particular she said to me that really framed my diagnosis and treatment moving forward was that she said, don't let diabetes define you because it doesn't have to. Diabetes has changed my life, but not in the way you may think. Diabetes has made me less afraid to take risks, and it started me on a process of inquiry that I don't know that I would have gone down otherwise. Passion rules my life, and I've always been a passion-driven person, but I think diabetes had made, has made me even less afraid to take chances. You know, I mentioned that I've been a, become an ambassador, an international ambassador for Freestyle Libre. I've been on billboards, runways, and I've traveled the world all while living with diabetes, and for the last uh, two years, while wearing a CGM visibly. But this isn't just about me. Diabetes made me mindful of the ways that we talk to and about people living with diabetes. It made me want to fight this stigma, not just for myself, but for all of us. So thank you so much for having me. Elise, the message that you shared was so powerful. And I want to thank you specifically for sharing such personal experiences with all of us. Just like I said with Renza, centering the voices of people with diabetes is going to be so key for all of us in our advocacy efforts. And hearing the stories of people from all over the community allows us to paint such a rich tapestry of what the actual experience of living with diabetes looks like so that we can push back against that harmful status quo that there's only one story of what diabetes is. Thank you so much, Elise. Thank you. And I really hope that everyone here feels encouraged to share their own story. I am reminded that the diabetes community worldwide is over 400 million people strong, and there's a lot of power in 400 million stories. Thank you so much to all of our Lightning Talk speakers today, Renza, Brian, Tony, and Elise for participating in our program this year. I know that I learned so much, and I hope that all of you in the audience today have as well. Thank you to everyone who joined us. If you're interested in learning more about diabetes stigma, the need for disruption, or you're just interested in resources for combating diabetes stigma in your personal life and in your professional life, I wanna encourage you to visit our stigma-focused website, destigmatize.org. That is D-S-T-I-G-M-A-T-I-Z-E.org. We're going to be pasting the link in the chat for you right now. And if you're watching the recording of this event on YouTube, the link for destigmatize.org can be found in the description below. Thank you so much to our program sponsors, Dexcom and Eli Lilly and Company. Without your support, this event would not have been possible. Finally, as a reminder to everyone, we'll be staying online for the next half hour or so to give you time for community networking. Simply click the people icon on the left side of your screen to do this. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us today, and I do hope that you'll have a great rest of your day.